All right. Before before you say that, we have I want to get into the Big East preview. I know we got to get out of here. I don't yes. I don't want to have this be an hour and a half long podcast. So Big East, for the Big East, baby. We're going to preview the Big East. We're going to break it all down. I have seven topics of what we're going to do for each one of these conferences. We're doing five minutes on each one of them. All right. We're going to start. I want from each one of you the most interesting storyline this year in the Big East Conference Fanta. You are the king of the Big East. You are Mr. Big East basketball. What's the most interesting storyline? Sean Miller taking over at Xavier because I think that the Musketeers have had the talent to be an NCAA tournament program the last couple of seasons. They have not gotten there. This program went to 15 of 17 NCAA tournaments when they got in in 2018 as a number one seed. They haven't been back since. Of course, one of the tournaments got canceled. It doesn't matter. Xavier is an every year NCAA tournament program. That's what they've been traditionally. Miller taking over at Xavier is so intriguing to me because Shaw Miller owns a winning percentage of close to 75% of the games he's coached in. We know about his past. We know that there's the, the investigation of him, and we know that there could be some sort of a suspension uh, maybe early in the season that that happens. That is on the table as an option. But it's if it if it does happen, it's not going to be something that's too significant. And in my opinion, he just needs to tell the uh, the NCAA that he was um, helping kids move, and he's been helping kids move to Tucson for years and years and years and years and years. Right. <laughs> in my opinion, Xavier can win the Big East this season. They have that type of ceiling. They can challenge Creighton at the top of that league. And I think it has never been a question of talent at Xavier. It's been a question of the past couple of years of coaching. No offense to Travis Steele, but Xavier has fallen flat on their face in February the last couple of years. I really like what I'm seeing from this team. I think Colby Jones has a chance to be a Big East player of the year dark horse. And guys, remember the name Desmond Claude. He looks mm-hmm. like he's going to explode on the scene in Cincinnati, and that's a great fan base. It's an awesome atmosphere. Xavier returns to the map nationally this season. Des Claude, New Haven's finest uh, potential one-and-done guy. I think that that's a, there's a non-zero possibility that he's one-and-done in, uh, in Xavier. T.O., most interesting storyline, Big East Conference. Uh, I love that one, and then the fact that Sean's having to deal with Fremantle uh, is a big thing as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that kind of plugs into that storyline, which is huge because you're adjusting that culture. Mine is uh, St. John's backcourt. Look at uh, Curbelo and Posh Alexander. Neither one of them can throw it in the ocean. Both are electric playmakers. One defends. One is all flash. It's either going to be the best thing St. John's fans are is ever going to see. It's going to be the worst thing. St. John's fans are ever going to see. I'm so intrigued by how they mesh together. There's not a ton of shooting on that team. That's going to be interesting in and of itself because those guys are going to be driving into a paint that's going to be packed. Somebody's going to have to step up from the perimeter and they're going to have to knock down shots. The, number one in the country in pace with two lightning fast point guards and playmakers. That's going to be so much fun to watch. Not to mention, Champagne had 15 and six last night in a preseason game for the Sixers, I believe. I looked at like, yep, yep. If he was back, I would be all in on the, on the Johnnies. He's not back. They need somebody to shoot the rock. I'm worried about that, but I'm also wildly intrigued by those two playing together. St. John's is going to win one or two games that they, they shouldn't win, and they're also going to lose like three or four games. You're like, how how are you losing to FAU? Like, how, how mm-hmm. are you losing? How are you losing to Iona? What is happening here? So and they they're going to have a game where it's going to be like they're going to come they're going to have like 40 assists, both teams combined, and then they're going to have a game where both teams combined for 40 turnovers. Yeah, <laughs> because they're going to de- they're going to defend their butt off. They're going to get a turnover. They're going to go down. They're going to dribble it off their foot, and then it's like it's just going to be an absolute. It's going to be so much fun. The 17th row. He's going to throw it into the upper deck at MSG. Well, the good part about when he throws it, he doesn't know where it's going because he's not looking where he's throwing it. So if it does go up in the 15th row, it'll be fun. It'll be a pretty 15th row pass. He's going to be dropping dimes to Fanta, who's calling the game from Carneseca Arena. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> um, to me, the most interesting storyline is who fills the power vacuum at the top of the conference, right? This has been Jay Wright's league, more or less, for the last six or seven years. Uh, Villanova made the Final Four last year. They did not win the Big East regular season title. That was Providence. Um, now we see Sean Miller coming in. 
and he's going to stake his claim and make a run at it. We see uh, Creighton, who is going to be everybody's preseason favorite to win the conference with what they bring back and what Greg McDermott has been able to build. Um, I think UConn is going to be very much in that conversation, right? I probably would have them third or fourth. There's a chance that they could end up winning. Uh, Providence is the – they're the reigning, reigning champs in the league. We got Shaheen Holloway coming home to Seton Hall, right? So with Kyle Neptune taking over at Villanova, who is going to step in? Who is going to make this be their league? Who's going to kind of take control of the conference? Or is it going to be one of these things where now it's every year we're going to have a race? And I think it's a lot more fun when it's every year you're going to end up having a race. All right, speaking of that, I want to know who you guys consider the favorite to win. Tio, I'm going to you first on this one. And who you think has an actual real chance to be able to contend with them? Uh, Creighton, in, in my mind, right now with all their guard play, they've got a year under their belt. They still have, like, I, I think Arthur Kaluma is one of the best wing scorers with that big, strong physical body. And then I don't understand. This, I'm I'm going to go on a personal gripe right now. Uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner was what? He, he was an all mm-hmm. honorable mention Big East player last year. He was the defensive player in the year, and he doesn't make one of your teams. Like, are we not? Are we completely eliminating voting from that side of the floor? You don't think he impacts more than that? I thought he should have been first or second team for sure. He's on my preseason first team all league for a reason. I think he's extending his game out. He's been working on his shot. That team has guards everywhere. Nimbard's back. He's healthy. Trey Alexander got a lot of minutes at the point during his absence. This team has tools. And not only that, the addition to Baylor Shireman, poof, it's going to be speed on speed. They're going to run the floor. They're going to pitch to open shooters, and everybody can shoot, and they have a go-to score with the ball in their hands in Coloma. I love Creighton. I'm going with the jersey that Rob is wearing as a team that can compete for the league. Hurley can do it. And not only that, he's got Adama Sanogo, who could very well be an All-American because of his production level. The dude is a beast inside. I like this UConn team. Andre Jackson is a guy that – does a little bit of everything for you. He's not somebody that's going to get a ton of pub. He's going to be right around that nine and a half, 10 points a game. He's going to get three or four, re- or he's going to get five rebounds. He's going to get three or four assists. I like his makeup beside the guys they already have. And Jordan Hawkins is just waiting in the wings to be great. Like, is he going to be able to take that step? That's a big thing for them. Another guy that they're going to need to be good. Uh, Tristan Newton is East Carolina transfer going to have to be really good for that team, but they have secondary ball handling. They have scoring, they have playmaking and they have a beast inside. I think UConn could legitimately win it. Hmm. Creighton is the clear front runner for the reasons T.O. just listed. I'm not going to sleep on Villanova though. Not so fast, my friends. When you look at what they still have, Caleb Daniels, Brandon Slater, Eric Dixon. Dixon is underrated nationally for the role he serves for Villanova. He mans it down low. And somebody said to me a couple weeks ago, I don't know if he can handle it all. Let me tell you something. He can handle it all. They'll have Nanan Joku come off the bench, but you're going to see a lot of Dixon now. The variable of all variables is this. It's not Kyle Neptune on the sidelines. That's, that's, not, that's not what I'm looking at and saying, oh, I'm really concerned. Or they, like, And it's not me discounting Jay Wright. It's me looking at the fact that by virtue of their roster, Villanova, not known as a freshman factory, is going to have to rely on Cam Whitmore and Mark Armstrong to do things for them. Now, I have gotten every inclination – that Cam Whitmore could be Villanova's best freshman in 25 years. And there's been some lethal freshmen. Whitmore looks the part of an NBA-ready player, of the first one and done in the program since Tim Thomas back in the late 90s. Ooh, Timmy T. Timmy T. The biggest dimension of Villanova challenging at the top of the Big East is Justin Moore's return timeline, which I had unveiled a couple weeks ago. He is tracking towards right around the start of Big East play. Guys, that changes the entire Big East picture because if a healthy Justin Moore comes back and Justin Moore's even half of what he was, it's like making a midseason trade acquisition. So for me, Villanova's going to be challenging there. Xavier will be challenging there. That's my tier one in the Big East. UConn fans may not like me for saying it, but the biggest question I have with UConn is still this. What is happening for that team offensively on the perimeter? I know they've got the talent. I really think that they do. But it's about Tristan Newton, Naheem Aline, as well as Hawkins, being able to provide 
versatile options for UConn. If those guys are performing at a high level, then yeah, UConn can challenge at the top. But let's not totally forget about the fact that you lost two really high-level players in R.J. Cole and Tyrese Martin. And those are some big losses to have to make up for. Yeah, the biggest thing with UConn is that they don't have – basically what their offense was last year is we're going to run a bunch of false motion. We're going to try to get one guy into an action where he's getting a shot coming off of a certain play, whether it's Adama on a duck-in, uh, Tyler Polly running off of a double screen, whether it's Jordan Hawkins running off of a pin down, things like that. And then if that didn't work, it was basically put the ball in RJ's hands and go make a play. And they don't have that guy where you can put the ball in his hands and go make a play this year. Tristan Newton is going to be fine. Tristan Newton is not going to be RJ Cole. RJ Cole was a 16 and five first team all Big East player who was probably, look, I, I love Adama. RJ was the MVP of that team last season, right? RJ was the most important player on that team. So that's going to be the big issue with them. I will say this with Andre Jackson available. Um, you do kind of have two playmakers in the backcourt and with Alex Caravan, with Jordan Hawkins taking a step forward. Um, and, you know, with uh, Naheem Aline and Joey Calcaterra, you have a couple more shooters and Asan DR coming off the bench. I think you have a change of pace point guard, um, but you guys hit on all of the uh, the keys. I don't think we really need to. I like Hassan Diara. He, yeah. he's, he's a nice little piece. Yeah, I don't think we need to go too deep into – we talked about the, the top four is Creighton and then Xavier, Villanova, UConn, and it's all about, like, whether you eat, like, pepperoni pizza or sausage pizza or cheese pizza. It's all going to be what your flavor of the month is. All right, the most underrated team in the conference. Can I go first on this one? Yes. The Butler Bulldogs. You want to talk about coaches coming back home? We got Thad Mata coming back home to Butler. I think that he addressed – a couple of the critical needs that Butler team had last year. One, shot blocking around the basket. He had Mandy Bates and he had the kid from Georgia State. Um, I'm blanking on his name. Jalen Thomas. Uh, they, they are going to have some of the best rim protection in the conference. And I am saying that knowing that Ryan Kalkbrenner is at Creighton. Uh, I think that the combination of that plus a couple of those freshmen getting a little bit older, plus the addition of Eric Hunter, who can be a, a, uh, a, a ball hawk at at the point of attack that can make threes plus your boy T.O. Ali Ali Good coming player. in on the wing. You're going to be able to play four round one. You're going to be a little bit older. You're going to have a rim protector at the bucket and Thad Mata say whatever you want about him, right? He had Ohio state as the best program in the big 10 from about 2006 to about 2013. And I don't know if he's going to be able to make it be like this with Butler, but I look at that roster and I look at that coach and I say, that is a tournament team. And I don't think people realize that Butler is a tournament team this year. Fanta, where do you stand? Oh, the DePaul blue demons. Oh, <laughs> let's go. I'm going bold. I'm going let's outside go. the box. I'm telling you, um, I've got some some signals here. I can see them out in the distance of the of the wind and the and the clouds from Chicago. It's like a bat signal, but it's got the Blue Demon logo on it. I know that they lost some some major pieces in in Javon Freeman, Liberty, and David Jones. Um, I don't think that they feel in that building that they are in a place last place. I think that that's a team that is going to be more connected, even more connected than they were last year. I think that's a team that still had scars from the Dave Lado era in Tony Stubblefield's first season. If you probably didn't watch much of DePaul, folks, the listeners here are probably saying Fanta is out of his right mind. He's out of his damn mind. But that team should have, and I know should have, should have, should have. Should have won a number of games last year, and they didn't. They do have some pieces. Umoja Gibson from Oklahoma is a bucket getter. That kid scores at a very high level. Caleb Murphy coming in from Minnesota was a high-level transfer addition. They still have Nick Ongenda. They have a kid named Philmon Gebrowit that I think is a really interesting piece to the puzzle. And Tony Stubblefield, you could say whatever you want about, about Tony. Here's what I know he was able to do by the end of the season. He had that team playing pretty hard. He had that team defending significantly better. He had that team in games. They bring Terry back as well. Uh, Jalen Terry is back. I think DePaul, they're not, they're they're getting underrated because they're probably going to pick to finish last. And I have a gut feeling that they make a little bit of a of a step here this season. And guys, I can't sit here and tell you 
that like, I think that Providence or St. John's or Seton Hall are underrated because I think they're probably all going to finish jumbled in the middle of the league. I think DePaul takes a step forward and I'm a little bit down on Marquette and Georgetown. So I'm going to go with the blue demons. I'm going out way outside the box here. Hey, I will say this, Caleb Murphy. It has NBA potential. He is wow. so fast. T.O., for the record, T.O. has been on this for, like, months. He texted months. me in the middle of August. Literally in the middle of August. And he's like, hey, what do you know about Caleb Murphy at DePaul? I think he's a pro. And I'm like, why are you texting? I'm, 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 on, the, I'm on the beach. Why are you texting me? Like, <laughs> from DePaul? What is wrong with you? Well, Terrence, so, was it? Oh, I'm, I'm just breaking down some film on him. I'm like, on DePaul in August? Yeah. Karen, tell me out here. Was it an awful pick to say that they're a little bit underrated? I, I, I like that. Now, do I think they're going to be in the top five of the league? No, no but I think no. jumbled in the middle is, a good, is possible. I certainly think it's possible, and a lot of it's because of Caleb Murphy. And not only that, like, he's played defense before playing for Brian Ge- Gregory down South Florida. Like, he's a – he is – I'm telling you, if you guys go and watch clips of this young man, he is so fast with the basketball, and he changes directions so well. Like – and does it in just spectacular fashion. He is so much fun to watch. And not only that, 6'4", a buck 85, a buck 90, however big he is, like he has NBA-level speed, NBA-level athleticism. He passes the ball real well. He just doesn't shoot it. And what's the one thing that all these NBA guys think they can teach? Shooting. Like, don't be surprised if you see this guy just dominate the G League and end up on a roster. Hmm. I can't believe that we just did a – we're doing a Biggie's preview. We're going to talk more about fucking DePaul than we are. First of all, Robin first of all, disrespect. In Seton Hall. Disrespect. Unbelievable. He didn't pick his underrated team yet. I didn't. Well, see, this is the problem. This is why our, all of our podcasts end up being an hour and 45 minutes long. Because, you know, <laughs> pick right. your team. Who you got? No, well, there's not really that many teams, but I, I Seton Hall – you said they're going to be jumbled in the middle. They could creep up in that top little tier. I, uh, dude, I'm so I'm so worried about saying the word tier wrong. You guys have gotten <laughs> all in my head for the past few weeks. It's not I have, that, like tier, it's not like that I, hard. Like if, if there's hey, one word that you should be worried about, single tier here. Every time I don't say tire. So <laughs> there you go. There's that. Uh, those guys are good. And what, what have we talked about, guys in other power five leagues or power in the other power five leagues, like? who transferred to the Big East and turned into really good players. Alamir Dawes was a really good player at Clemson. Mm-hmm. Femi Odukali was a really good player at Pitt. They just didn't win. Like, they have multiple guys that kind of fit that mold. And they got a couple – they got the young man from Louisville. Oh, gosh, here we go. Dre Davis. Yeah, Dre, Dre Davis. Davis. Like, and his brother Tay. And his brother Tay is a bad boy as well. They still have those talented four and five men with Tyree Samuel, Trey Jackson, Yetna, like – if they're healthy, they're really good in the front court as well. And uh, how do you pronounce it? Indefu? Indefo? Yeah. Casey Indefo. Indefo. That dude is everywhere defensively. Yep. We play – when I was on staff at Clemson, would have been his freshman year. We, they St. Peter's came down and played us, and they were a handful. And a lot of it was because he was everywhere on the floor. I don't think it's going to change just because he changes jerseys no. and moves across town. Yeah, there, there's a – the rumblings coming out of what is it, South Orange, Fanta? The rumblings yep. coming out of South Orange is that he's been one of their best players in practice. Their best player. Yeah. He's and been can, their best player. He, the com- transition to the Big East is not going to make a difference. That kid, if he could do it against Kentucky and Purdue, he could do it in the Big East. Yeah. And right. they're not going to ask him to be a guy that scores 15 points a game. It's just go out there, muck stuff up, make plays defensively, be six, seven with a long wingspan and athletic and energetic, take some charges block some shots, be switchable. Like For the like, record, the best choice of these choices was Rob's. I agree with you, Rob. Butler would have been my pick. I didn't want to repeat. I really like what Butler could be. So this is, I think this is the I first I like Seton Hall too because Kadiri started practicing. Yeah. <laughs> He's brought it upon himself to show up to practice. What were you going to hey, say? Well, I, I finally stole a pick from you. Normally it's you stealing picks from me. That's normally how it goes. All right, we got to keep this thing rolling. All right, I want to talk about what the proper expectation is for each team should be. So let's, we're going to start. I'm going to tier it where final four, mm-hmm. sweet 16, Tire. get to the, uh, win a game, yep. get to the dance, mm-hmm. or just make any postseason. So let's start with final four. Who can have actual final four expectations? Let's go quick on this. Fanta. Creighton. Creighton, that's easy. T.O.? Nobody. 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 So I think Creighton is a – is. I think that they're a top five team in college basketball this year. Yeah, and I'll get I, the reasons why when we get into the bowl predictions. Yep. And I do think that Villanova, with the caveat that Justin Moore 
mm-hmm. come March is back to being Justin Moore. I think if you can give me Justin Moore, Caleb Daniels, Cam Whitmore, Eric Dixon, and literally anybody else in that program, I think that that group is good enough to make a run to a Final Four. Okay. I agree. Several, so, several Sweet 16 level teams. In my yeah. Mind. So, all right. So, Sweet 16, who, who is. Who, who ha- should have the level of expectation that they should be a Sweet 16 this year? Go ahead, T.L. Uh, Creighton, I think they're an Elite Eight team st- deep in the second weekend. UConn has that ability. Villanova has that ability. Xavier, they could win a game in the tournament. Sorry. So the top three in my mind, Creighton, UConn, Villanova, those three. Are our second weekend teams? Yeah. Fanta? Xavier, Villanova, UConn would be the three teams that I would pick yeah. for second weekend a consideration. Villanova with Final Four aspirations. Rob, I agree with you on more. I also think the one thing about Villanova is Jay did not play his freshman last year really at all. So Jordan Longino, Angelo mm-hmm. Brizzy, guys that are kind of getting overlooked collectively on the roster because they might not have as much buzz. But Villanova actually has more depth than they've, than they've had beforehand. So – uh, but the, the Sweet 16 teams would be Xavier, Villanova, UConn, Creighton's in the – they're absolutely Final Four aspirations. Yep. I'll, we'll also note about Villanova, Brandon Slater had ankle issues and shoulder issues and foot issues and everything issues after the first two months of last season and probably should not have been playing down the stretch of the year, but he's a tough mf on that Villanova team and he was not going to sit out. So uh, getting him back healthy I think is a huge addition as well. Like we were talking about him as a potential second-round pick for a while at the start of the season. He was shooting like 40% from three, dunking on people. So getting him back will be good, big as well. I think Villanova, you can make an argument they're being underrated. All right. I think Providence should have the expectation for winning a game. I want to talk about them a little bit. They're the reigning champs. Uh, and, I mean, they're they're basically retooling everything. It's Jared buying them in a bunch of transfers. Fanta, I know, were you down there yep. yesterday? So you saw him practice. Talk to me about him a little bit. Well, Bryce Hopkins is going to be an all-Big East player mm-hmm. if everything shakes out. Guys, I walked into the gym. It took me no time to figure out who he was and what he was about and what he was doing. You want to talk about having a different body frame. You could see why he was recruited to Kentucky. I talked with him at length yesterday. He said it's so hard when you would check into a game for Cal. And he goes, nothing against Cal, but I knew I was going to get taken out right away. He goes, I just knew. And he said, I couldn't play that way. I couldn't live that way. He goes, I just... He goes, I know people now are going to doubt me, but he said, I just feel more comfortable here because at Providence, they're going to let him rock. They're Mm -hmm. going to give him the basketball and they are going to let him rock. Ed Cooley told me yesterday, he reminds him quite a bit of Rodney Bullock, uh, a friar in the past in Cooley's tenure. He told me Ben Bentle. Ben Bentle a little bit too. LaDante Henton, like these big combo forwards that are just buckets. And that's been something that Providence, when they're at their best, they have had that guy at the four slot. Even last year, to a lesser degree, Noah Horkler served that role really well for Providence on catch-and-shoot opportunities. They're going to try to move Hopkins off of screens, get him separation, get him looks. The key for Providence is what you just said. It's not the front court. Ed Crosswell will hold things down at the five. He'll be serviceable. He'll be, he'll be a good option. He, he could be a breakout candidate. The key for Providence is what happens in the backcourt beyond Bynum. Because last year, you had Al Durham. You had Justin Minaya on the wing. You had A.J. Reeves. Now they're going to ask for Devin Carter and Noah Locke to step up. And let's face it here, perimeter play for Providence was a major difference maker because defensively you had to account for Watson in the paint, so you're going to have to give something up. A lot of teams have packed it in against Cooley's flex. They're going to pack it in again. Carter and Locke taking shots is different from Reeves and Minaya and Durham. So my concern for Providence is perimeter shot making and being able to get a collective buy-in from that group. Jaden Pierre is a freshman guard who's going to get some time. He's a bit underrated, but uh, I I think they're going to be a middle of the pack team. I think that they'll probably finish fourth or fifth in the league, maybe sixth, four or five, six in this league. You probably could interchange for, for most days. I think Providence fits right in there. Yeah. So I I think Providence is in a tier of their own as like not quite as good as UConn Xavier and Villanova and not quite at the same level as Tournament teams, I think St. John's, Butler, Marquette, Seton Hall are the four teams, T.O., that I, I would argue are good enough to make the dance where that should be considered a successful season. Disagree? Yeah, it, yeah no, I 
I was going to kind of hash in on, on Providence a little bit. Noah Locke's a really good shooter. He doesn't really have a playmaking bone in his body. He, he is what he is. He, he's a shooter. He, he can space the floor. He knows what he's there for. He's going to continue initiating the offense. The biggest question for me is shot making besides him. Like, Horacler was very valuable because he, he had so much gravity within that offense. That flex stuff that Cooley runs, when you have a four-man that can shoot the ball, like, it spaces a lot out. Like the shot making besides him. And then if something happens to bind him, who's your backup guard? Is it going to be Corey Floyd? Is it going to be Jaden Pierre, who I've heard good things about? Quante Berry's not ready. Like backup point guard play, who's going to handle the rock? I, I like Devin Carter. I think he's a good player. I thought he was really good uh, at, at South Carolina. Uh, not necessarily the best playmaker for others, but he can get to the cup. Who's going to be a playmaker outside of that? Yep, I agree with all of that. Uh, I do think that they – they're probably good enough to be – they're going to be in and around the top 25, depending on what Bryce Hopkins is, depending on who or how good Carter, Locke, and, and Corey Floyd end yep. up being. Like, they'll, they'll have a chance. Ed Croswell is going to be a, a 12 and 10 guy this year. Yeah, beast. Beast. You know, okay. Very little very, very little question about that. All right, let's get into some of our preseason awards. Preseason player of the year, Adama Sanogo. Is there any any argument against that? Hmm. No. Well, there's, there's so many arguments from Omaha – because he's owned Ryan Kalkbrenner, but it's really hard to assign a player of the year to Creighton. Owned by, owned by Ryan Kalkbrenner, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, uh, Ryan Kalkbrenner has owned him. Yeah. Um, there's so the problem is, and Creighton fans would get upset at this, but Creighton, you have a complete team. Like there's Bingo. not one, there's not one player that's except there's there's a couple of exceptional talents. But it's hard to pinpoint a preseason player of the year because if you name it to Shireman, you're kind of taking away from Kalkbrenner. Here's my bold take. I think the player of the year could be Arthur Kaluma. Oh, I have a I have a bold prediction that'll be interesting there as well. All right. Who's your who's your player of the year, TO, and your coach of the year? I got Sonogo and then coach of the year. I think Sean Miller's gonna do it. Okay. Manta. Yeah, I'll go Sonogo. Coach of the year is an interesting question. Uh, I'm going to go with Thad Mata. I'll go with Thad Mata and Butler in his return season. Yeah, to me, the preseason guy that you got to peg is either going to be Sean Miller or Greg McDermott. I I think that if Greg McDermott wins the Big East for Creighton, like you got to make the argument he should be coach of the year. Uh, First team All-League, this is what I wrote down in the Almanac. Jared Bynum, Caleb Daniels, Cam Whitmore, Adama Sanogo, and the big homie, Ryan Kalkbrenner. Is there anything on there that you would change, either of you? I had uh, Posh Alexander on there, Caleb Daniels. I didn't have Cam Whitmore on the first team. I have a hard time putting freshmen on the first team. Yeah. Yeah, I would swap Whitmore out, um, and I would put Colby Jones in there. I, I really believe in Colby Jones, so I'm I'm going to go with him on my first team with Sonogo, with Daniels, with Kalkbrenner, and I have one other slot. Um, who did Posh. you have? With Posh, Posh Alexander. Posh yeah. Alexander gets in there for me. I don't put freshmen on the first team. Fair can, enough. Can, 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 I'm sorry. I know we're running short on time. Colby Jones, I, I understand the intrigue, and he played well late, but what does he really do? Well, just a multi-tool offensive player, and I think that Sean's going to continue to get that out of him. I think he's also a really good defender. They're going to have him get the rock and make plays time and again. I mean, he needs to be the centerpiece of that team, so I'm betting on Xavier to be a top-20 team in the country. And I think that Jones is the centerpiece of that team. So maybe I'm higher on him than others, but I'm putting him on the first team. I also am putting him on the first team because, guys, one thing about the Big East is there's not a ton of proven A-level scorers back in the conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Proven. Proven. Second second team, I got Cam Jones, Nunji, Nimbard, Jordan Hawkins, and Cam Whitmore. Yeah, my second team, Ryan Nimbard, Chuck Harris, a butler, posh. Colby Jones and Jordan Hawkins. And I will say this about Jordan Hawkins, and then we can move on. Um, if UConn is going to be a team that actually competes for the Big East regular season title, as opposed to being a team that ends up like 13 and 7, 14 and 6, Jordan Hawkins has to be a 17 to 18 point per game guy, like a stud, like have a James Book Knight kind of break. Like he's a different player than Book Knight, but have that kind of an impact on an offense and the attention that a defense has to give them. Um, your X factor in the regular season title. Race. T.O., I'm going to go to you first. Uh, Zach Fremantle's ability to handle Sean Miller. That is the X factor of how good Xavier can be, in my mind. Well, 
the X factor for me was going to be Jordan Hawkins because I think if they can unlock him at UConn, then UConn can win the league. I just it's one of those things where I need to see it to fully believe in Hawkins. I think that the other X factor to the regular season title race is how Trey Alexander continues to rise here in year two. He was the main proponent of Creighton's run at the end of last season. He managed games. He did so many things well for them. He initiated that backcourt, and it's almost as if Ryan Nemhard's injury unlocked this side of Alexander that we had not seen before, but it also made Creighton a tougher prep because teams were blindsided by what Alexander was doing late last season. So how do Alexander and Nemhard coexist if it's as good as what we think it could be? And guys, Creighton's going to win the Big East regular season crown. But being the hunted, being the hunted is such a different role. And they that know. might be the biggest of the factors here. How does Creighton handle being the biggest game on everybody's schedule? Normally in the Big East, it's Villanova. Not this year. Creighton is the biggest game. Yeah, so I think there, there's a couple here. Um, I think that I expect Jordan Hawkins to be really good. I don't if I don't know if he'll be an 18 point per game guy, but I, I'm I'm kind of penciling in like 14 to 15. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I think the I'm biggest yeah. the biggest X factor is like point guard play at UConn. Tristan Newton, what kind of impact does he have? How does he work in concert with Andre Jackson? To me, with Creighton, the X factor is um, one like the the sophomore leap that the Nemhard Alexander Kaluma class takes, and also the impact of of Baylor Shireman. Mm -hmm. I expect him to basically be what Mitch Ballack was. And maybe a little bit of a better pass. So like the way that, that you can like kind that. of manipulate defenses by running him off of screens, the actions that you can put him in, the yep. fact that that dude is going to hit 35 footers this year, like he just is. He, he has range for days. And the fact that then all of a sudden you have three playmakers on the floor because Trey Alexander, we've seen him be a point guard, and Emhard, we've seen him be a point guard. And Baylor Shireman was like the guy that initiated offense in South Dakota State. So yes. um, that's going to be interesting. But to me, look, the Xavier freshman too, like Des Claude and Cam, um, Cam Kraft, their impact, I think, is important. But the biggest X factor is Justin Moore. Like, what is he come February? Yeah. Right? Like, is he, he's coming off a blown Achilles. And I know, Fanta, I know he told you he wants to be back by the end of December. That, to me, that is a, like, I'm going to have to see it before I believe it. Like, Achilles injuries, you you don't come back from blown. Like, you can't rush that, you know? Like, it's, it's a very, very difficult yeah, thing dude. to get back from and to get back to the level that you were at before. Uh, I do think that there is a benefit that Justin Moore does not rely on just raw explosiveness to survive. Mm -hmm. Like there's an element of craft and guile to his game that I think is going to um, kind of nullify what the impact of the Achilles is, but it's still, it's a torn Achilles. Man. I agree. Like that is that. Yep. So his, what he can be when he comes back, I think will determine what Villanova's ceiling is. All right. It's time. It's bold prediction time. T.O., I'm going to you first on this one. I want your boldest, bold prediction. And you got to go bold, T.O. You can't pull one of these T.O. moves where you just say something. Oh, I don't want to get too uh, – I don't want to get too – I need a bold prediction from you because I got a bold one. Uh, Cam Jones at Marquette leads the Big East in scoring. I like it. This is a guy that it, it, he was kind of there. There were a lot of there were a lot more weapons with a lot of those guys. What was it Justin Lewis leaving and some of these other players leaving at Marquette? Cam Jones just kind of waited in the wings and played within the offense. This dude's a bucket, and he can do it a lot of different ways. He can shoot it from three. I think it was a, he shot over thirty nine percent as a freshman from three. He's got good size at six four, a buck ninety five. Like this guy can get to the rim he's athletic enough to finish and in that up and down helter skelter way of playing him playing beside tyler colic who's only a colic excuse me colic or colic probably colic 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 yeah, colic. Colic. yeah. Colic colic is what colic babies like have. a horse you know a horse's colic and their stomachs turn over no tyler colic him playing beside him those two uh will make for a heck of a one-two combo cam jones is is a really really nice player will lead the big east in scoring Fanta, you know all about horses turning over their stomachs, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, very wise in that area. You know all about it, is, yeah. that, is how he phrased it. All right, Fanta, give me your bold prediction. Oof. Xavier makes a Sweet 16 for the first time in six years. They have not been to a Sweet 16 since 2017. I'm buying all the stock in the Musketeers. I think that they're going to be there. And I think that for the first time, in the 10 years of the reconfigured Big East, this is notable history, there has not been a champion at Madison Square Garden from the Midwest side of the conference. Drought ends, not as bold, but drought will end. 
and we're going to have a Midwest tournament champion at MSG, which that that's certainly new, but I'm going to ride the Musketeers train. I think they make the second weekend of the tournament. I just really like their makeup. And I think Miller, as opposed to Steele, will have them playing their best basketball at the best time of year to do it. All right. So here's, here's my bold prediction. You touched on this a little bit earlier, T.O. I think that come March, we're going to realize that Ryan Kalkbrenner is the best player in the Big East. I think he's going to be the Big East player of the year. I think that we're going to be talking about him the same way that we talked about Walker Kessler at Auburn last year. I think he's going to be the national defensive player of the year. I think he's going to be the anchor of a Creighton defense that ends up ranking like top five nationally on a team for Creighton that wins the Big East, wins the Big East tournament, and then goes and makes a run to the Final Four. I am all in on this Creighton bandwagon, and I think it all starts with the fact that they have the best defensive center in college basketball, a guy that's going to be an All-American Defensive Player of the Year, and that we're going to end up saying in March is a top five big man in college basketball. So listen, this has been the Doster, the T.O., and Fanta podcast, the DTF podcast. That was the Big East preview we have coming up next week. Uh, I don't even have it written down in front of me. We have, uh, I think it's the big There'll 12. be another preview. There'll be another. We, we need to discuss who's next. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, we, we got the Big Ten coming up next week. So oh. we'll see you guys again next Monday. T.O., you better start preparing. Fellas, this has been fun. We're dropping our merch. We got to start calling Underwood Daddy Brad. But I'm a big odd guy. Breaking news. The Field of 68 has an online store, and it's your one-stop shop for the latest and greatest merch in college basketball and college football. You can find shirts to support your favorite team, make fun of your rival team, or boast Field of 68 catchphrases like Daddy Brad, Cussing and Discussing, and the Star Heels. Go to www.fieldof68.shop today and enter promo code TOUCHDOWN for 20% off at checkout.